Will the Canon EOS R and R6 kill the DSLR? Are mirrorless cameras better than DSLRs? I'll break down the difference between DSLR and mirrorless cameras, the pros and cons for each, and help you pick the best camera for you. Delivering informative capability-based reviews and tutorials on camera gear, filming techniques, and content creation. Hi, I'm Simon and this is The Ordinary Filmmaker. If you're new here, please like and subscribe as it really helps me grow my channel. And all the links to everything I talk about in this video, I put a link in the description down below. Before we get going any further, I want to make sure we have a clear distinction of the difference between a DSLR camera and a mirrorless camera. DSLR stands for Digital Single Lens Reflex. Unlike the aptly named mirrorless camera, the DSLR has a mirror that directs the light to the viewfinder so we can see what we're photographing. When you press the shutter button, the mirror moves out of the way, letting the light hit the image sensor. Mirrorless cameras, as the name implies, do not use a mirror, sending light directly to the image sensor. This is good because it eliminates moving parts and the possibility of mirror lubricant from, the, from hitting the sensor, and allows the mirrorless camera to capture images much faster than a DSLR ever could. The speed of the sensor being the main limitation here, but with any new technology, there are positives and negatives for both methods. This video has three segments. The first segment explores the differences between Canon mirrorless and DSLR cameras, but can be applied to all manufacturers. The second segment answers the questions of which capabilities are needed by the ordinary filmmaker and photographer. The third and final segment visually compares the current Canon lineup, R5 and R6 influence, how well they deliver photo and video capabilities, and how well they're priced relative to each other. As a given observation, mirrorless bodies are lighter and smaller than DSLR bodies, as are the lenses, but lighter isn't always better. Make the body too small and the buttons become smaller, there are fewer of them, and the camera, camera may not feel balanced or comfortable in your hands. Size matters. I find the M6, M5, and M50 to be a bit too small and comfortable in my hands like the Canon 90D. The EOS R, R5, and R6 fit better in my hand than the M6 Mark II. These cameras are better designed for professionals that need bigger bodies and better battery life. The EOS R weighs in at 660 grams, considerably more than the M6 Mark II, and heavier than the competition. I like the way the EOS R fits in my hands much better than the M6, but the EOS R is a full-frame camera, whereas the M6 is an APS-C camera. The larger sensor partly contributes to the extra size and weight. The average APS-C DSLR is several hundred grams heavier than the mirrorless equivalent. The mirrorless Canon M6 weighs 408 grams, while the Canon 90D DSLR weighs almost 300 grams more at 701 grams. You see, the old adage that newer is better is true when it comes to the RF system. Not only are the full frame bodies smaller and lighter, but lenses have lost weight, become smaller, and even perform better in most cases. The RF 70 to 200 does not provide better image quality, but it weighs a whopping 33% less than its EF counterpart. For people that travel with multiple lenses, saving an additional 454 grams on top of 300 grams for the body makes a huge difference. And Canon added a telescoping feature to this lens, so when it's not in use, the 7200 is shorter and it takes up only a single slot in your camera bag. Another popular lens, the 24 105, has also been transformed. It is 95 grams lighter than the EF version and 11 millimeters shorter. It also provides better image quality from the center to the edges and has less chromatic aberration. Canon hasn't simply ported EF lenses to the RF platform. They have designed a new platform from the ground up. New bodies and new lenses. If capabilities matter more to you than price, the Pro RF lenses offer clear advantages over the EF counterparts. They are superior to the EF L counterparts in size, weight, and performance, but be prepared to pay a hefty price premium. There isn't a large used market for these lenses, sales are rare, and there are only 11 lenses right now. Some are affordable, aimed at the price sensitive consumer, the rest are aimed at consumers that want the best quality and performance, and also weather sealing. The EF platform does have some 100 lenses available. Not sure which system to pursue? Well, for $100, Canon has an EF to RF adapter that lets you take EF and EFS lenses to be mounted on RF bodies without any issues at all. Looking into the EF-M system? Well, just be prepared, none of these lenses can be migrated to the RF mount. 
lighter and smaller works very well on the RF platform. Not so much with APS-C EF bodies. Poor battery, like fewer buttons and ports, and not so great ergonomics for people with large hands, the mirrorless M6 is considered smaller than the 90D or even the T, sorry, the 8 Ti DSLRs. But again, battery life is much reduced. Ask yourself what matters more. How will you be using the camera? Will you be traveling a lot? Consider the importance of size, weight, ergonomics, balance, and the availability of buttons and ports. Or consider having a small camera like the M50 for travel and another larger camera for your regular heavy lifting work. The Canon 90D is a capable high-end hobbyist camera, but it can be used for, for, for professional use. Sorry, The M6 Mark II is a mirrorless equivalent of the 90D. The price appears higher, but evens out when you buy the optional EVF. I like the 90D. Quality does suffer in low light, at high ISO, and it has less dynamic range than full-frame cameras. But for the ordinary filmmaker, these high-end APS-C cameras are excellent and popular choices, and they sell very well. It takes time to outgrow these cameras. It's true that full-frame cameras do cost more, but they do provide better results. But the APS-C Sensors 1.6 crop is a very useful, or it's very useful for wildlife photography, providing you an extra 1.6 times zoom at no additional cost. With a good quality lens, it's like getting a 1.6 times extender for free turning a 100mm lens into a 160mm lens. Full-frame cameras are not always better, and will cost more to run and operate over their life. It took me approximately 7 years to outgrow my Canon 70D, and I'm ready. I'm ready for a full-frame. I will miss that 1.6 crop for wildlife, but I appreciate the better color accuracy, low noise, and high ISO performance, and be able to produce more detailed 1080 and 4K videos, as well as portraits. If you're starting out, consider the APS-C. Consider cameras like the 90D, the upcoming T8i, M6, or the upcoming M5 Mark II. The key takeaway is that mirrorless is not always better than a DSLR. It depends on what you're trying to achieve. While the future is definitely with mirrorless, it will be a long time before DSLR fades away and dies. Canon developed dual pixel autofocus in 2013. It is considered by many, including myself, to be the best video autofocus system out there. Canon continues to develop the technology and brought it to the mirrorless cameras. Dual pixel uses two photodiodes for each pixel. A small micro lens is placed in front of the pixel, directing the light onto both photodiodes. Two separate images are sent to be processed. The phase difference between the two images is processed. This difference is used to calculate how much the lens needs to adjust focus to bring the subject back into focus. This is then communicated to the lens and it does its work. Dual pixel is fast, accurate, and it eliminates hunting. Focus transitions happen quietly. Dual pixel autofocus first appeared on the Canon 70D. Most cameras have since included dual pixel autofocus. I trust dual pixel every time I shoot video. I leave it on for every YouTube and run and gun video I shoot. Have you guys ever seen video uh, where the autofocus has missed? I could literally count on my hand the number of times it has missed. Most of those times it was related to something unexpected moving in and out of the frame. Dual pixel also works very well in low light conditions. As much as I like the 70D, new cameras perform much better than my 7 year old 70D. Canon has introduced deep learning to assist with face, eye, and object detection in the 1DX Mark III. The EOS R5 has been further improved, allowing animal eye detection. However, with DSLR cameras like the 70D, the camera uses a different focus system when taking photos. I look through the viewfinder and I see the world the way it is. There is no processing done to the image. Mirrorless cameras, on the other hand, show the world as it's seen through the sensor. They take into account ISO, exposure, white balance, color setting, and so on. Many professionals avoid mirrorless because they just don't trust these electronic viewfinders. They want to see the world as it is unadjusted. Now, granted, earlier mirrorless models were slow, not good at fast action or even sports photography because the electronic viewfinder just couldn't keep up. Most cameras have overcome these issues. Refresh rates are faster. They eliminate lag. Electronic viewfinders 
perform better in low light. Electronic viewfinders closely resemble the final photo, but are only accurate if you calibrate them correctly. Professionals are not keen to replace the huge investment they have in their existing systems when they work well and get the job done. Like any tool, it does take time to adjust to new ways of doing things. Electronic viewfinders tend to show more contrast than the captured image, leading you to overcompensate. But optical viewfinders have stopped innovating. For the ordinary filmmaker, the benefits of electronic viewfinders outweighs the remaining issues. However, if you are one of those fast action or sports photographers, you might want to consider or sticking with the optical viewfinder. DSLR options that fit this need include the flagship 1DX, the 5D, 6D, and the 7D. You could even use the 90D. Man, no, not really. Never mind, forget the 90D. I'm just a little bit biased. In video mode, a DSLR is a mirrorless camera. The mirror is moved out of the way and the light hits the sensor without any obstruction, just like how a mirrorless camera functions. Where do you think they got the idea to go mirrorless? The LCD display comes directly from the sensor. The viewfinder is disabled in video mode, but most Canon video shooters feel neglected by Canon. You see, Canon has been lagging the market in video capabilities going back to at least 2015, hurting both its customers and its market share. Just a flesh wound. This does not mean you can't produce great results with Canon mirrorless cameras. It just means that Canon cameras have fewer capabilities and offer less value when compared to the competition. Canon was late to the mirrorless market. They admitted this in their 2019 financial results, stating, although we have launched two full-frame mirrorless cameras, as well as 10 dedicated lenses, our lineup is still insufficient. This is a strategic choice to hold back development. Current DSLRs and mirrorless cameras are significantly behind competition in video capabilities, with the exception of their dual pixel autofocus. Canon removed all eye and 24 frames per second from several camera lines that previously had these features. Only one Canon camera is capable of 4K60 and it was just released. Many current cameras still don't have 4K. Video modes had a significant crop in 4K, providing a soft image, and in most cameras, lacking detail. The EOS R fared poor when held up against the Sony a7 III and its oversampled 4K, providing much better detail and results. Its price has since dropped in half as a result. The 1DX Mark III is the best Canon camera for video today, offering 4K 60, but costing $6,500. The next best choice is the $1,100 Canon 90D, offering soft, uncropped 4K. For the ordinary filmmaker, the honest truth is that Canon is far behind the competition in video capabilities. The 90D is a great camera and it sells well, but the Fuji X-T4 offers far more video capabilities. The X-T4 provides 4K60, detailed 4K60, detailed 1080, film simulation modes, we don't get those, and IBIS. If I was honestly looking for my first camera today, I'd likely choose the X-T4 over the 90D. The 90D is a powerful enough camera for the ordinary filmmaker and priced better than the competition. That same X-T4 I was talking about, it costs $1,700. So yes, the X-T4 is better, but requires an extra $500 to obtain. The 90D is a great starter camera and can produce very detailed 1080 if you shoot in 4K and down sample. It has a 33 megapixel sensor, larger than any other APS-C camera. It produces great photos and they're not gonna disappoint. I love the 90D. It packs a lot of capabilities for the price. The M6 is the mirrorless equivalent of the 90D, but the 90D edges out the M6. The electronic viewfinder takes up the hot shoot, leaving no place for a microphone. But in 2020, detail 4K should not be limited to cameras costing $6,500. IBIS is nowhere at all in their current lineup. There are no color profiles, and only the EOS R gets Canon C-Log. For Canon customers, from the pros to the ordinary filmmaker and photographers, the hope is in the future. Canon has shifted focus and designed the RF mirrorless system for both photographers and filmmakers alike. Video will play a huge role in the EOS R system, for sure. We are not just looking at video from a camera's perspective, we are also working on how to make RF lenses better for video capture as well. The R5 is a video-making powerhouse. 
DR6 looks to have solid video capabilities with uncropped 4K at as high as 60 frames per second. The R5, yeah, it leapfrog that with uncropped 8K at 30 frames per second with autofocus and IBIS in all 8K modes. In six months, video capabilities in Canon cameras will be greatly expanded. They will have caught up to the competition and in some cases, leapfrog the competition. At least four mirrorless bodies are due out this year. The maximum shooting speed for DSLR cameras is right around 16 frames per second. And this is where the mechanics start to break down. The lube applied to the mirror leaks out onto the sensor, causing spots to appear on your photos. Let's think about this for a minute. Moving the mirror in and out of the way 16 times a second, hour after hour over the life of the camera, puts incredible strain and demand on the components. It's very difficult to get 16 frames per second, and it's unlikely Canon could engineer speeds much faster than that. And that sensor spot issue in the 1DX Mark III tends to go away after you've shot 2,000 shots. Sensor throughput and quality is the only limit for mirrorless cameras. It doesn't take much to offer 30 frames per second or even 120 frames per second. Each camera is limited to the amount of data that can be processed and transmitted. The 1DX Mark III is capable of a whopping 995 million pixels a second. If the sensor was big enough, it could process a single 995 megapixel image each second. It could also process 100 megapixel images a second or 16 62 megapixel images a second. A mirrorless version of the 1DX with the same sensor size could process 49 frames per second. This assumes the camera doesn't have any bottlenecks and it's at that same 20 megapixel size. Mirrorless has the potential of giving us fast action sports photographers much higher frame rates without sacrificing quality. Think about it. Could you imagine the EOS R offering 40 frames per second? But the key takeaway is that mirrorless cameras offer faster frame rates and can last longer than DSLR counterparts, counterparts without much strain. For the ordinary filmmaker and photographer, the minimum ideal frame for sports photography is right around 7 frames per second with autofocus, continuous autofocus. I've gotten great results using the 90D shooting water skiers. As you can see right here, the 70D does a good job of maintaining focus even when the skier falls. The camera doesn't always nail autofocus every time, so I tend to do a little bit of that spray and pray approach. The R6 and R5 will go up to 20 frames per second. The EOS R and RP with continuous autofocus perform miserably at around 3 frames per second max. As I mentioned earlier, smaller and lighter are often cited as benefits to mirrorless cameras, but smaller cameras come with smaller batteries. These smaller cameras like the M5 or M6 will not perform nearly as well as their DSLR counterparts. The R5 and R6 should perform much better as Canon claims the new battery will have the same size and shape as the 5D Mark IV and hopefully more amperage. If you're looking at the M5 or M6, you'll get about a fourth the shots as the 90D and only about 45 minutes of record time on video. The Canon M50 is capable of 235 shots per charge, while the M6 is marginally better with 295 shots per charge. Meanwhile, the 90D, a DSLR version of the M6, gets a whopping 1300 shots per charge. That's four and a half times more shots. Now I get it, real, real world results will differ. I'm reporting SEPA numbers. Both cameras can deliver more shots in real world scenarios, but the 90D battery has more power and requires less of it to do its job. The 90D has 1865 milliamps versus the 1040 milliamps on the M6. One way to improve battery performance is with a battery grip, but there goes any benefit to that size and weight. Canon has been making EF glass for 30 years and EFS glass for 17 years. There is a healthy used market for these bodies and lenses. Though they cannot use the newer RF lenses, but the new RF system can adapt EF and EFS glass with a simple and effective adapter. While Canon is continuing to make EF glass as long as there is demand, they are focusing on the RF system. New focal lengths, improvements to existing focal lengths, and weight reduction are common with this new system. As I talked earlier, the 70 to 200 lost a third of its weight and is considerably smaller, only taking up a single slot in your carry case. 
the 28 to 70 is an example of a lens that offers incredible detail for portrait and wedding photographers. The RF system is not limited with a lack of lenses. While the RF system had three lenses in 2018, it has 11 lenses today with eight more due out this year, along with two extenders. Not enough? All EF and EFS lenses can be adapted to the RF system for $100. There are plenty of affordable lenses that make the ordinary filmmaker happy and plenty of advanced lenses to make the pro happy. If you want the latest technology, focal lengths and lighter lenses, the RF system offers many benefits to DSLRs. If you bring your EF glass to the RF body, don't expect IBIS to function as well as it does with the native RF glass. If you're still here, thank you, but go ahead and do me a favor. If you haven't already done so, please click like and subscribe. Now let's get back to the video. The price difference between full frame and APS-C cameras used to be huge. The Canon M6 Mark II is the mirrorless equivalent of the Canon 90D. It's a solid camera with many good features for the ordinary filmmaker. It has a 32.5 megapixel sensor and 4K recording, and it can be had for $849. Add the electronic viewfinder and it's $1099. The Canon EOS RP, the entry-level full-frame camera, offering better low light and more detail, can be had for $999. Sure, the M50 can be had for $599, and the T7i can be had for $399, but the photo and video capabilities are not that impressive. You will outgrow these cameras in a few years and spend more again looking for a new one. Focus on the capabilities that you need rather than the cost. Select the camera that gives you what you need. If it costs more than, if it costs more than you have budget, consider saving longer and getting what you need. Full frame provides better low light performance. Where the shooting video or photos, you get less noise when shooting inside or outside in the early morning, dusk, or even at night. However, this works against you in daylight. To compensate for the extra light, you need to increase the f-stop, eliminating any background blur or bokeh that you would have had. If you want that bokeh in daylight, a neutral density filter is needed. An ND filter can be purchased for each stop, or you can purchase a variable ND filter to cover several stops. Avoid cheap ND filters as they produce unwanted effects. Good ND filters can cost $100 each. Variable ND filters can cost $300 or more. And the worst part, you need to purchase different ND filters for each lens you have unless, of course, they share the same diameter. For this reason, I don't bother with ND filters. They are expensive, get misplaced, and take time to add and remove. But Canon, in their infinite wisdom, decided to develop a variable ND filter that sits between the mount and the lens, so only one is needed for all your lenses. The only issue is the selector it's very sensitive. It's easy to bump and adjust. This can be solved by placing electrical tape over it. It costs $3.99, not the electrical tape, but the adapter. This is the biggest complaint that I have for the filter, though, so hopefully they'll come out with a way to fix that selector so it's not easily bumped. Hopefully they'll come out with a Rev 2 soon. Full-frame sensors have better dynamic range and low-light performance, but what does this actually mean? Everyone always talks about and assumes that you know what it means. I don't want to make that assumption, so I'll give you a quick overview. Think of dynamic range this way. You are inside a vehicle shooting the driver. In the frame, you can see the driver, the driver's window, and part of the windscreen. With low dynamic range and the driver properly exposed, the window and windscreen are overexposed, resulting in nothing but white light. A camera with more powerful, or sorry, with more dynamic range will properly expose the driver and the outside scene through the windows. More dynamic range means the camera can see more of what we can actually see. Low light performance means that in low light, say at an ISO of 9600, the image has less noise than an image with poor low light performance. Low light does not refer to night or dark conditions. Low light refers to anything that's not outside. Inside, for example, in a store, in your home, or at night if you're outside or in low light such as dusk or sunrise. Look at the photos you took outside and compare them with photos you took inside. You'll see the noise on the inside picture. Full frame will always be better than APS-C for low light and dynamic range. Color accuracy is also improved with full frame cameras which help when color grading. 
Canon has also stayed or started throwing in C-Log into their mirrorless cameras, and it can be purchased for some DSLRs, but it requires sending the unit back to Canon. C-Log provides more dynamic range and helps with color grading. Lenses designed for full frame offer better optics, less chromatic aberration. Sounds great, doesn't it? Everything is better with full frame, right? Well, not exactly. Better bodies and lenses mean more cost, and you lose the ability to zoom in as far with the same focal length. I still love that 1.6 crop when I'm shooting wildlife. I have the 100-400 EFL, and it has produced some amazing results. I shot this duck from so far away that he doesn't even know I exist. Uh, this one, though? I suspect he's not happy with me. He, he feels I'm up to something. Maybe he thinks I'm going to make Peking duck or something. Or, I don't know, but I'm glad he doesn't have a gun. Well, it's a mistake to assume that APS-C means low quality. Be aware that the quality ranges significantly from the 7D Mark II all the way down to the Rebel T7i. But then the price reflects that, doesn't it? It all goes back to developing your roadmap. Understand what it is you want and why. Understand all the accessories that you need to get the job done, such as an adapter or a variable ND filter. Budget the system cost over a few years. If full frame is what you want, save for it. I'm ready for full frame. I want the detail. I want less noise, and I want better color grading capabilities. I also want to have access to some truly amazing lenses. Lenses that will take me a year or two to save for. I could have upgraded to the 90D. I could have upgraded to the 80D and then the 90D, or even the EOS R. I didn't, and I saved thousands of dollars. I waited because they didn't deliver the capabilities that I needed. Now, I have enough to purchase the R5 if it meets my needs. Unless, of course, the Canadian dollar continues its slide, in which case, I'll just have enough for a used Canon power shot. Up to this point, I've talked about the differences between Canon mirrorless and DSLR cameras, and what sets them apart. This segment focuses on delivering the outcomes we need to get what we need out of the camera. The next and final segment visually compares the current Canon lineup, along with the R5 and R6, how well they deliver photo and video capabilities, and how they're priced relative to each other. I'll boil everything down and focus on the results. Are Canon mirrorless cameras better than DSLRs? That's like asking, is an electric car better than a gasoline car? You want a yes or no answer to a simple question, but there are, no, there are too many variables to make a simple statement like that. I recently conducted a poll asking you if Canon mirrorless cameras were better than Canon DSLRs. The majority of you correctly said that the statement makes too many assumptions. I'll overlay both mirrorless and DSLRs in a simple graphic. You'll see that some DSLRs are better than some mirrorless, and vice versa. Start by asking the right questions. Ask yourself what you want out of a camera. Do you want accurate autofocus along with face, eye, and animal eye detection? Both Canon DSLRs and mirrorless offer face and eye detection autofocus and provide overall reliable autofocus. But the R5 is the only Canon camera confirmed to have animal eye detection. So if you want animal eye detection, there's only one possible Canon camera for you. Both Canon DSLR and mirrorless cameras are capable of detail 1080 and 4K video, but it will cost you a lot to do so. Only the $6,500 1DX Mark III is capable of delivering high detail 4K video with a small crop with autofocus or uncropped without autofocus. And only the yet-to-be-announced R5 and R6 are capable of delivering high-detailed 4K. All other Canon mirrorless and DSLRs provide soft 4K, but the promise of the R5 and R6 give hope for these capabilities in the near future. Because we don't have the R5 or R6 in hand, we can only go with what we have been told. That's why I'm not scoring the mirrorless better. If you are if you're, if you're one of the few that want 8K, then the R5 is really the only option for you. But will it be detailed? We'll have to wait and see. Clearly, the mirrorless platform is more video capable with the R5 and R6, and certainly a lot more affordable. The mirrorless platform offers better slow motion capabilities, and only the 1DX Mark III can provide 4K60. 4K 120 is not even an option for Canon DSLRs, and 120 frames per second in 1080? Yeah, not so good. Mirrorless wins here, again, offering 4K 120 with the R5. The R6 will provide 4K 60. With the R6 and R5, 
Are we going to get frame rates greater than 120 and 1080? We'll just have to wait and see. Both platforms offer the same basic frame rates. 24 and 30 are considered basic for North America, 25 and 30 for PAL regions. However, not all cameras are treated equally. Some cameras are still missing 24 frames per second. Canon provided a firmware update for the 90D, G7X, M6, and RP. The 1DX Mark III was released without 24 frames per second, if you can believe it, but it just got 24 added in firmware 1.1 three weeks ago. I think Canon is done with removing 24 frames per second in their cameras, though. The R5 is the first Canon camera announced with IBIS. No other Canon DSLR has IBIS. Or sorry, no Canon DSLR period has IBIS. And the upcoming T8i is not expected to have it either. For photo shooters, IBIS is not that essential, but it can be a real plus for video shooters if it's done right. It allows ordinary filmmakers to stabilize any lens without the need of a tripod. It's excellent for run and gun work. I hope Canon's implementation is as good as Panasonic's implementation in the GH5. I want a camera capable of stabilizing video while walking. I walk heel to toe to help get the most out of lens stabilization today. You can also use a tripod anchored to the bottom of your camera. That extra weight slows down the camera movement, making it far less noticeable. In this video here, I showed how to create stabilized video using a glide clam and three other cheap techniques that produce similar results, so I encourage you to go check out that video. Canon was smart by releasing the EF to RF adapter and ND filter along with the EOS R. This adapter allows us to migrate all our existing EF and EFS inventory to the RF system. The adapter is only $100. Sometimes you can even get it tossed in for free with a kit purchase. There are no issues with focusing or compatibility. The EF and EF lenses will function as if they were on an EF body. With one simple product, the EOS R has access to decades of EF glass, allowing customers to migrate their existing glass. I wish Nikon had spent a little more time on their FTZ adapter. It's plagued with uh, compatibility issues, rendering it useless for anyone that values reliability. There are no reported issues with Canon EF or RF adapters. It works flawlessly. I can migrate my existing lens library, making the switch a little less costly. Just one thing. IBIS is more effective with RF glass than it is with EF glass. Color accuracy improves as you spend more. The newer and the newer also generally better. Having good color correction saves time and effort in post. The R5 and R6 provide up to 20 frames per second electronic and 12 frames per second mechanical. That's encroaching on the 1DX Mark III territory. No other DSLR can reach these speeds. It's fast enough to work as fast as a fast action sport shooter, but how well will it work as a sport shooter will depend on the specs yet to be announced, like buffer capacity and speed. For the ordinary filmmaker and photographer, these figures should be more in line with, or they, they should just be fast enough. I love the flippy screen. The Canon 50D didn't have it, nor did I care that the 7DD had it when I upgraded, but very quickly I fell in love. I love the flippy screen. Once you have it, you won't want to go back. It's great for getting those hard to reach angles without wrecking your back or getting your clothes dirty. It's glad to see that Canon is making this a staple in mirrorless. For DSLRs, it's not available in high-end cameras. I like having dual SD cards, but only if I can record video to both cards at the same time with the same card type. Otherwise, it's not much help. Dual card slots is standard for both the R5 and R6, but it's still considered a high-end feature. Canon is known for their ease of use across their camera range, mirrorless or DSLR. Menus are simplified and organized. Long after setting up the camera, it's easy to go back and make changes without getting lost or having to read the manual. These are the basic capabilities I look for when comparing cameras. You might find low light performance or audio quality more important. Build your own capabilities. This does not have to be comprehensive. It just needs to be enough to cover what you consider mandatory and what you consider important capabilities to have to select the right camera. This segment takes all the capabilities and features and puts them into a simple, understandable chart. Canon has a lot of mirrorless and DSLR camera models available for purchase. Canon has released three DSLR cameras since October. 
uh, since October of last year, that is. The Fast Action Sport Centric 1DX Mark III in the first quarter, the general purpose photo and video Canon 90D was released in Q3 last year, and the T8i was to be released but has been delayed until June. But the really exciting and anticipated models due out this year belong to the RF mirrorless platform. Canon released the M6 Mark II as a mirrorless version of the 90D in Q3 last year. The much anticipated R5 is expected to be announced by the end of May and should be available for sale in July. Fingers crossed on that one. Couldn't cross my finger because it's broken. But supply dates could change and likely will. Next up, the Canon R6 due out in June. Then there's the high megapixel version camera, a mirrorless version of the 5D RS, the most photocentric camera in Canon's lineup and expected to offer 80 to 90 megapixels. And lastly, there is the low-priced RF body designed to replace the RP. 2020 is definitely shaping up to be Canon's year. But this makes selecting a camera very difficult. Add to this the SL3, T7i, EOS R, RP, M50, M5, and it becomes hard to assess the photo and video capabilities. Using the capabilities I came up with earlier, I created this chart. It shows DSLR and mirrorless cameras available for sale. DSLR models are painted green. Mirrorless are painted red. The size of the circle represents the current market price. In most cases, the more costly, the more capabilities a camera has. But this is not always the case. While the 5D is more capable camera, more capable in photo, it's a frustrating disappointment for filmmakers. That's because Motion JPEG was the only codec for 4K video. Um, you, you, the, the detail isn't very good. Uh, you get a huge crop. You get poor dynamic range. 120 frames per second is only available in 720. And even then, autofocus is locked. Spend less. The 90D provides us with uncropped 4K, though it will not be as detailed as the 5D. And the 90D offers 120 frames per second in 1080 although we still have to deal with locked autofocus. The chart is not without errors, nor is it impartial. I added my bias through the capabilities I discussed earlier. If you agree with those capabilities in large part, well, then this is a good model to help you decide. If not, come up with your own capabilities and chart them using my model as a baseline. The point is, the chart is just a means to help me cut through all the data and the specifications and look at the capabilities, but let's simplify it a little bit more. If you have a thousand dollar budget, the Canon 90D is your best option. It has a 32 megapixel sensor, the best offered by any APS-C <laughs> the best offered by any APS-C camera, and it produces good videos and photos. It produces 4K, 120 frames per second in 1080, but you should also look at the Canon T8i and the M6 Mark II, but neither of these have weather sealing. The Canon 90D does, but you also need those weather sealed L lenses as well. The M6 is the mirrorless version of the 90D, but can cost more than the 90D if you purchase the optional EVF. And if you do purchase the EVF, you use up that hot shoe, leaving no place for flash or a microphone. The 90D provides more value and features. It has much better battery life. Don't underestimate the benefits of longer battery life for travel and for video and photo shoots. A thousand dollars also gets you into the EOS R or RP, but neither are masters of photos or videos. These are Canon's first full frame mirrorless cameras. They were rushed. They are one offs. That means there's not going to be a successor to them. 4K is soft. 120 frames per second is not available in 1080. Well, not with autofocus. And well, I, I don't even want to get into 1080 on. Um, the EOS R RP, it's just a major disappointment. The R5 and R6 are coming and will be announced and available for sale by early summer. The R5 is expected to be priced between $29.99 and $39.99. And yeah, I get it, that's a lot of money, but it's gonna be packed with features. It's gonna offer uncropped 4K, sorry, uncropped 8K, 120 frames per second in 4K, and at least 120 frames per second in 1080, have C log better color accuracy, better autofocus, 12 frames per second mechanical, and 20 frames per second electronic. It's a solid camera aimed at 5D customers and an attempt to bring back customers that left for Sony and others. 
the R6, would be priced between $19.99 and $24.99. It will offer uncropped 4K, 120 frames per second in 1080, have C-Log, better color accuracy, better autofocus, 12 frames per second mechanical, and 20 frames per second electronic. Another solid camera aimed at the EOS R customers and people looking for a solid, powerful video and photo camera. Sales will follow, but not right away. December and May are the best seasons for sales. We saw some amazing sales this past December and are likely to see some great sales in May. For video, the R5 and R6 are the most capable cameras with limited information that we have today. What's the best $500 Canon camera? There's only the T7, but you run the risk of outgrowing this camera sooner than later. The SL3 costs more and offers fewer capabilities. The M5 costs more and will be replaced in the coming months with the Mark II. So we could see a price break when the Mark II is released. For video-centric users, the R5, R6, 1DX, 90D, and M6 are the best options with the 90D and M6 being the most affordable camera options in this bracket. I'd personally choose the 90D over the M6 as a better choice for video-centric users. But the EOS R6 may be the best or may end up providing the best value once it's announced. If you're photocentric and rarely use video, then consider the EOS R. While it's no leader, it offers many improvements over the 5D Mark IV, and in fact, it uses a lot of the same sensor or processor technology. It provides better dynamic range than the 5D, a faster processor, better autofocus, and more autofocus points. It has a larger buffer, better LCD, and it has a flip screen. It performs better in low light, is a silent shooter, and has a more sensitive EV of between minus 6 to 18, and is half the price. It's a lot to go there, but it only has a single SD card slot. And yeah, it's very slow in continuous autofocus. While it's advertised at 8 frames per second, the EOS R rarely gets over 3, three frames per second max when in continuous autofocus. But again, if you can wait a few months, the R5 and R6 will satisfy so much better. To sum it all up, the T7 is a good entry-level camera with a price that won't break the bank, but be prepared to grow out of this camera in a year or two. The 90D is a great general-purpose camera that performs very well as video and a photo camera priced just right. Then there is the R6 and R5 that will likely exceed expectations. The R6 demands $2,000 while the R5 demands around $4,000. Lastly, if fast action and sports photography is your thing, the 1DX right now is your best choice, but the R5 and R6 could do well and could be more than enough for many. Thank you so watching. Thank you so. Thank you so much for watching this long video. If you have any questions, post a comment down below. I'll review your comments and get back to you shortly. This video took quite a bit of time to put together. It took about a week of research, and it took about two hours to record. It should have only taken about an hour, but I'll get into that lesson learned shortly. But this video was all about coming up with a topic ahead of time. It was not about just coming up with an idea that I really liked. And yes, I did like the idea of doing a video about DSLRs and mirrorless cameras and which one's best. And that simple question is asked a lot. But what I decided to do this time, I decided to do some research, not on the topic, but on what topics would be perceived well, which topics would get a lot of views. So I use this tool on the internet to find out, and, and you can actually use free tools. So for example, if you just start typing away in Google uh, under the search, you notice that it has a type ahead feature. And those listings that come up, those are the most common search terms or search phrases. Well, I used another tool and what it does is it not only shows me that information, but it shows me the, 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 the price or the amount of money I can get per click or per view, and how popular it is, like how many views a month does this particular search phrase get. So I did some searching and I came across, I, I don't know how long it took me to figure this out, it wasn't that long, I came up with the idea of doing a search or doing a video on DSLR versus mirrorless, which one's better. So I researched my tags a little bit more, I got all my tags ready and I thought, yeah, this is a really good video. Now, unfortunately for me, this type of video requires a lot of research. While I can talk anecdotally about it and off the cuff, it would be free of details. So I started writing this last Monday, putting it together, 
And by, I think it was Friday around four o'clock, I started filming. And this is where I encountered my first mistake. So I, I did a pretty good job. And the reason why I scripted this out and writ this one out is there's so much information. It's easy to get things such as T7 or T7i mixed up with T8 or T8i, EOS R and RP mixed up. And this stuff happens. I even had a mistake in this video where I talked about the T7i when I was really talking about the T7, <laughs> even with it scripted. So the mind does crazy things. And by scripting things out, you eliminate or not eliminate, you reduce the risk of this happening at all. But in this video, I had things set up ahead of time. I usually, once I'm finished recording a video, I check to make sure everything's right. I check my lights, I check the camera, and I put a card back in and I format it so everything's ready to go the next day. Because sometimes I get topics that come to me right away and I have to start filming them. So I want my kit ready to go. I don't know what happened. I don't know if my son came downstairs and accidentally bumped into the camera, or if I did something when I press record, I caused it to tilt a little bit. But essentially, a good six inches or so of the desk was cut off and I had more on the other side. And it was something I could have fixed in post, but it would have meant drilling in a bit more. I would have lost more. It, the, the image would have been more soft. And I thought, no, I'm not going to do this. And I had shot about 60% of this video. That was a lot. That was an awful lot of work. So I immediately went back, formatted the card, put it back in and started recording. This time around, things went really, really well. In fact, you'll see that there's very, very few edits. I think I went the full, um, again, two thirds of the video and I was able to do it in about, um, geez, I think it was just 30 minutes. Cause I remember I filled the card. I forgot to keep track of the time and I filled the card. And so I went a full 30 minutes without having a stop. Then unfortunately I got a call because I forgot to turn my phone off and that distracted me. So the next two segments took me longer to film because I was, I'd been knocked off the puck, so to speak. I was distracted and it took me a while to get back into it. That's why the first part of the video is so much smoother. And one thing I guess is a lesson learned here is not only check your setup, but it's a good idea if you are using a script, run through the entire thing once. If you're not using a script, run through all your points once, see how well it goes. It gets you primed, gets you into the mood. So when you film it a second time, it goes a lot smoother. Now, this is a little embarrassing too. Uh, I, and I don't know how this happened, the two mistakes. So I told you about the one where I referred to the camera, the T7 as a T7i. Um, and again, you can't make everything perfect. You're gonna have some mistakes. Don't worry about perfection. Uh, I, I certainly don't make enough money out of this to worry about perfection. And you'd be surprised at how little I get from each video. Uh, the most I've ever made from a video is $40. Uh, when you consider the work that goes into it, there's no way I would want to do this as a living. I think um, this video that I'm, I'm finishing up probably took a good 20 hours from scripting, from ideas to the finished product. And that doesn't include the time I put in afterwards for engagement, responding uh, to messages and comments and questions. So there's a lot that goes into it. I don't do this for the money. I do it for the fun. This is a hobby for me. I really enjoy filmmaking. I really enjoy this challenge of starting a YouTube channel. I saw a lot of people doing it and I thought like, how hard can this be? So I set it up, I tried it. I purchased some new stands, some new lighting, new equipment, new devices, and it is a lot of fun and I'll keep doing it while it's a lot of fun. It's not about the money. I could honestly get a minimum wage job that will pay a lot more than this. I wouldn't be surprised if I took into account all my effort. I'm barely pushing a dollar an hour. But going back to um, the mistakes I made, uh, when I talk about autofocus, you might notice at one point that the audio changes a little bit. And that's because for some reason, when I was talking about autofocus, I went in and talked about um, dual pixel, uh, or sorry, um, now I'm forgetting what it is, but I said something that was completely, and it was in the script, so I'd made this mistake. And if you've ever seen the movie Bruce Almighty, well, you've got the anchor there and Bruce is changing stuff on the fly. And of course he's reading it now. At some point he should have stopped saying the things he was saying. I like a do da cha cha. But I just went with what was on the, the teleprompter. I just read what was there. I went with it and <laughs> I now had to fix it in post. 
So thankfully, um, it didn't take an awful lot of effort. The, the word that I said incorrectly used pretty much the same lip movement as the word I said incorrectly, so I was able to fix that up. But don't worry about perfecting things. The, the one real big lesson here is, if you are going to use a teleprompter, if you're going to invest in that, decide when you're going to use it. Decide how it's going to help you. For normal everyday videos, I don't use a teleprompter. I use it just for that first or second paragraph to make sure I nail it perfectly each time, because that first 15 seconds matters a lot. After that, I'm going point form, and that's what I'm doing here right now for this behind the scenes segment. I've got point forms, I've got about 10 of them up there, and that's what I'm doing, I'm covering them off. So, when you're new, it's really tough because there's so much for you to learn. I mean, there's still so much now, but I, you know, I, if you take this to the depths of forever and the ends of eternity, I've got a glimpse of what is involved, but when you start, you really don't. Teleprompters are nice. Uh, what they do is if you're going to script things out, they allow you to stay on track. But the problem is when you first start out with these things, you tend to look at it and you read and you come across as a bit of a robot. So I'd advise not starting with a teleprompter. Do like I did, start without one. And then when you're ready to get into some of those more detailed uh, videos, uh, and if you've got a memory like mine, then yes, a teleprompter can help you out. But that's it for today. Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video and behind the scenes. If you have any questions, put them in the comment section down below. And as always, I do appreci appreciate your feedback. Thanks for watching. We'll see you again soon. Thank you for watching The Ordinary Filmmaker. All equipment used and notes are placed in the description box, show more box, or down arrow thingy next to the title on the mobile app.